stuff for today is finishing out the disorders that I wanted to highlight, as specifically based on a myth that you may have heard of. Um, so, like, so, so we're going to talk about two different psychotic disorders, according to the DSM-5 umbrella category of psychotic disorders. Um, and I'll describe the, the clinical use of psychotic versus the common use of psychotic, uh, because they are different. They're similar, but they are also different. One is used in a clinical way, obviously, and one is, one is a more pejorative thing. But, uh, and then once we're done with that, we will switch to, um, therapy and some thoughts about, some thoughts I have about therapy, both, um, from my perspective and from, uh, the data's perspective about, like, you know, the effectiveness of, can, can we, there we go. All right. So how many of you have heard this myth? This is our last myth that we're going to talk about, I believe. I don't think I have a myth for therapy. Um, schizophrenia means you have a split personality. Let me know in chat if you have heard this myth before. In some, in some manner. It doesn't have to be verbatim, word for word. But if you've heard something like this about schizophrenia and personalities. Okay. Let me know. So we've got one yes, two yeses, one no, okay. We've got a yes, yes, common misconception, yeah, as I have uh, myth four up there, yeah, for sure. Okay, a lot of people have heard, a lot of people have heard it, yeah, sounds familiar, yep, 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 yep. <sighs> So, yeah, I'm going to talk about Split and um, another good film. So, obviously, it's a myth. As you can see, I wrote it on there for you. <laughs> uh, so, this is, a con this is a common misconception, as Gentleman Scientist um, mentioned in chat. Uh, it is a conflation of two different psychotic disorders with actually two different sets of experiences and symptoms it's a conflation okay and so what i first want to talk about is what the name disorder in that myth which is schizophrenia okay or schizophrenia you may hear it pronounced in those two ways okay so the f the the idea behind psychotic disorders is very important so, psychotic disorders are characterized, the, the entire classification, are characterized by psychosis. Hence the name psychotic disorders. Psychosis is a break from reality. Okay? It's a break from reality. And generally speaking, a break from the perception of a shared reality. So there is something about this person that um, is seemingly not right because they are not sharing my same experiences about, you know, what's uh, the sounds around me, the, the smells, the, the, the sights around me, the conversation that we're having, the emotional impact that we are um, experiencing, so on and so forth. There is a separation of that individual from reality okay that's what psychosis is so that's what clinicians mean when they say someone is acting psychotic now when you hear the term psychotic as an amateur psychologist when you hear the term psychotic you probably think of things like insane crazy uh violent maybe um a danger to themselves or to others, okay? Um, in a, in a, maybe not negative sense, but it's less than positive when it's, when the word psychotic is interpreted by, um, lay individuals, okay? Or amateur psychologists like yourself. It is not what 
clinicians mean when they use the term psychotic. And that's one of the things that I, I want to impart to you when, as we go through some of, as we've gone through anxiety and, and, um, and depression and, you know, some of the terms that we use, um, in our daily lives, um, to reference something as extraordinary or odd or wild that we tend to use things that were, uh, attributable to a less understanding society, like things like crazy or insane, psychotic, um, loopy, lunatic, these sorts of things, these, these words. So I just want to impart that to you all today, like, um, maybe lessen the use of, of psychotic, unless you are meaning it in the clinical sense, which is essentially what I'm going to um, go over with psycho uh, with schizophrenia here right now. Just a just a, 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 a simple little nudge in understanding that um, words are hurtful sometimes. Okay. All right. So schizophrenia. Now we have the psychosis, so that is the marked symptom. So we have irrationality, distorted perceptions, and lost contact with reality. Okay, so those are the, th th that, that is psychosis right there. Okay, so you can clearly say marked by psychosis. Yes, okay. So some of the things that come with psychosis are hallucinations, okay. Hallucinations are seeing things, feeling things, hearing things, smelling things. So sensing things that don't actually exist. Okay, so those are hallucinations. I'm sure some of you have had auditory or visual hallucinations on or off drugs. Uh, <laughs> on or off drugs. So it's uh, hallucinations don't necessarily mean you are psychotic. Um, because you can have perceptions in the absence of sensation uh, for a number of reasons. You can have fever hallucinations. So just getting, having a high enough fever to where you start seeing, feeling, tasting things that aren't there, right? But, of course, coupled with psychosis means that, um, these things are hap happening outside of a shared reality among non-schizophrenic persons. Okay. Delusions. I, I, uh, I see this a lot. People refer to delusions when they actually mean hallucinations, or they refer to hallucinations when they actually mean delusions. Delusions are, what are, are literally false beliefs. Okay. Delusions are false beliefs. Okay. So... To be delusional is to have beliefs that are demonstrably false, okay? Somebody could say, oh, well, no, this is, clearly it is false right here. And then if you keep believing it, then you are delusions. So some of those delusions could be paranoic delusions. So thinking that somebody is after you, um, you could have uh, delusions of grandeur. Okay, so thinking you are um, grandiose and, and great and magnificent, okay, or that the things that you do will be great and magnificent, or that you are more important than you are. So those are, um, those are delusions, okay. Um, another interesting byproduct of delusions can be um, garbled speech or what's referred to as word salad okay um, and this could be because selective attention is being broken uh, and so you can't stick to one thing or the other you're kind of just like all over the place okay um, if I were to put a name to all of these, uh, hallucinations, delusions, hallu um, hallucinations, eh. hallucinations, delusions. These are called positive symptoms of schizophrenia. 
positive symptoms of schizophrenia, okay? Because they are added to the experience of reality. They are in addition. So if I were to have a baseline state, having hallucinations and delusions um, as a function of psychosis, then they are adding to my experience of the psychosis, right? So these are positive symptoms, okay? On the other hand, we could have negative symptoms, which is diminished and inappropriate emotions. And generally speaking, it's it's diminished because one of the things that um, schizophrenic patients um, suffer from quite frequently is flat affect. So emotionless, uh, a state of no apparent feeling, okay? So this would be a negative emotion because if we are, again, if we are at um, non-psychosis baseline, then having flat aff- Oop, let me move it up. Having non-flat affect, or, excuse me, having flat affect or, ah, oh, because that thing returned in my eye, then that's below baseline, okay? Because your affect should be up here, but it's down here now. And so that would be a negative symptom of schizophrenia, okay? Other things can be, um, other negative, uh, negative symptoms can be things like inappropriate motor behavior. So, um, you could, uh, you could come across a schizophrenic patient who has catatonia. So somebody who's catatonic. Okay. Um, as well as, uh, others who just do senseless compulsive behaviors, like maybe punch themselves or smack themselves okay so those are negative symptoms so these these two hallucinations and delusions are positive diminished inappropriate emotions as well as inappropriate motor behavior negative emotions or uh, negative symptoms excuse me negative symptoms okay now there are two kinds broadly speaking in the DSM for uh, schizophrenia, okay? Um, one is acute and the other is chronic. So acute schizophrenia, which is generally referred to as reactive schizophrenia, this begins at any age, any age, and it frequently occurs in response to emotional trauma, an emotionally traumatic event. And recovery is um, long. So um, acute schizophrenia can be something where somebody has a psychotic break, which is probably something that you've heard of. And um, what I mean by a recovery period is period of non-psychosis, okay? Uh, periods of non-psychosis. So when you say that the prognosis is this person will recover through perhaps drug therapy, um, using antipsychotic medication, um, like um, the uh, descendants of Thorazine, for example, um, this person will be psychosis-free for longer periods of time than they had the psychosis, right? So let's say the psychosis la lasted a month. Then the recovery period can be a span of years before another psychotic break if they maintain their, their therapy, okay? Okay. So that's acute schizophrenia. Happen at any age and usually in response to a traumatic, uh, a traumatic event. Okay. Um, and then you have chronic. Chronic schizophrenia, which is referred to as process schizophrenia. This music feels very uplifting. Um, this schizophrenia, generally speaking, appears in adolescence. Late adolescent, mid to late adolescence. So somebody who's 14, 15, 16, up to 18 or so. Uh, but it could also occur in early adulthood, so in, in somebody's 20s, okay? And here's the prognosis for somebody being diagnosed with um, schizophrenia at 17. The prognosis is not great for chronic schizophrenia. Obviously, the name chronic generally gives you an idea that it's a lifelong, it's going to be a lifelong um, issue, okay? We are changing that song. A lifelong issue. 
So the prognosis isn't super great. As the person ages, psychotic episodes will last longer and recovery periods, so non-psychosis periods, will um, get shorter, okay? And so people who deal with chronic schizophrenia, generally speaking, um, if it's severe enough, will be institutionalized, okay? Um, but there is good news. Good news, everyone. Um, even people with chronic uh, schizophrenia, uh, using a combination of psychotherapy and drug therapy, can actually work their way to uh, being self-sufficient and independent with chronic schizophrenia. Lots of times the prognosis isn't that great, but it can be done. It can be done. Okay. Now, one of the issues um, with schizophrenia is that we don't actually know a lot about it because again we are observing as psychologists we are observing the effects of the disorder rather than the disorder itself it's not the same as um gastroenteritis or uh appendicitis it's not the same thing as that kind of of easily detectable infection okay and so we are observing its behavioral effects and these behavioral effects we have, you know, classified as, as psychosis. And so not a lot is understood. So there's still quite a few open questions for understanding the, the causes. I f keep forgetting that I've moved this stuff. So brain influences. Brain influences. One of the leading theories for schizophrenia is that there's too much dopamine okay dopamine overactivity so you should have some baseline level of dopamine to um make you feel good when you're supposed to feel good and not I interrupt when you're not supposed to feel good it dopamine's the 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 reward neurotransmitter just on the the face just on a very basic level okay and so if you have too much of it, it's potentially intensifying the brain signals that, um, that, uh, that you might have, okay? And so if it's intensifying these things, then that might create those positive symptoms that we talked about, those hallucinations and those delusions, okay? Um, other abnormalities, post-mortem analyses um, show that, um, that perhaps that too much cerebro cerebrospinal fluid uh, fills beyond the uh, ventricles where those f that fluid should be. Um, and so this causes shrinkage, okay? Um, smaller than normal corpus callosum, which is the bundle, thick bundle of axons that go back and forth between the two halves of your brain, okay? Um... Other, and so those are post-mortem, so that's when somebody's diagnosed with schizophrenia dies and then they examine their brain, okay? Now, those post-mortem analyses are confounded by um, other comorbid issues like drinking too much, um, like too much alcoholic, you know, a history of Alzheimer's, dementia, and so there's a lot of confounds with doing post-mortem analysis. Um... Uh, analysis on patients has been uh, sh has been done, like in an fMRI or EEG um, electroencephalograph, where activity is seemingly low in the frontal lobe. I mean, this this is sort of weak. This is sort of weak uh, evidence. Um, there has been some evidence that suggests that the thalamus and the amygdala are way too active when people are experiencing hallucinations, which essentially just says this person's experiencing hallucinations because your thalamus is your sensory switching area and the amygdala is connected to um, lots and lots and lots of, of, of sensory uh, inputs. So whether or not the brain, it, I think dopamine right now is the best 
uh, is the best one, but it doesn't catch, it's not fully explanatory for all schizophrenic patients, okay? G uh, genetic influences, um, so odds of being diagnosed with schizophrenia are about 1 in 100, okay? That changes to 1 in 10 if you have a diagnosed family member. So schizophrenia is extremely heritable, okay? Um, here's the crazy thing about its heritability. Adopting children increases their risk if a biological parent has schizophrenia. Weird, right? There, it's a, a lot of genes, so there's no real, um... There's no real handle on what genes that we're talking about. Again, if we're talking, if we're, if we're focused on the dopamine over, overactivity uh, explanation, then maybe we're talking about genes that influence the production of dopamine and other and the activity of those, right? Um, so lots and lots and lots of of genetic. Uh, connections here and so you in this graph you see a multinational study um that does not include the united states but the united states is somewhere around the germany levels in the mid mid to late 90s so this is from the mid to late 90s a lot of these statistics have not changed um in fact they may have gotten actually a bit bigger now that we have basically two more iterations of the DSM, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders. Okay, and you can so the the red bars are identical twins. Okay, so if that's the percentage, that's the concordance rate for an identical twin who is diagnosed with schizophrenia, and then the other twin having it. Okay, the other twin having it, and this is compared to fraternal twins. Okay, so you can see that generally speaking, forty or more percent concordance rate for identical twins. So 40% or higher for each of these countries. But then when we compare that to fraternal twins, that is um, dizygotic twins, we see that um, the, the concordance rate is much lower, okay? And the concordance rates for non-twin siblings is even lower than fraternal twins. It's about the same but it's, it's a little bit smaller, about the same, okay? This does not change the fact that, generally speaking, 1 in 100 are the odds of being di diagnosed with schizophrenia. So about 1%. That changes to 10% if you have a family member. Changes to 10%. So 1 in 10. Wow. That's all. I mean, that's quite significant. The... The thing that I want to impart to you before I, I talk about dissociative disorders is that at no at no point did I mention anything about personalities when I talked about schizophrenia. At no point was there any discussion about multiple personalities. No, sir. No, sir. Um, and so here's where the conflation happens. The conflation happens with another kind of psychotic disorder. Um, which is, has a sub type called dissociative disorders. So there are uh, a number of different kinds of dos dissociative disorders. So schizophrenia is a disorder, okay? But dissociative disorders are a subclassification of psychotic disorders, okay? Um, they're controversial, and that is because we ha don't know a lot about them. We do not know a lot about them. How many of you have seen Split? How many of you have seen Split? Let me know in um, in chat if you have seen Split. Um, and that is... <laughs> and if you've seen Split, if that is your first um, experience with something like dissociative or multiple personality disorder. Like... Had you heard about multiple personality disorder or dissociative identity disorder before that? Hmm. So, 
the the interesting thing about Split, and I give I'll give some credit to M Night Shyamalan, is he he plays with it a little bit, which is fine. <laughs> which is fine. Um, you know, there's always going to be uh, uh, artistic license for these kinds of things. Um, but I give M. Night Shyamalan a little bit of credit by trying to attach it to real life. And that is um, a, a, a person who is essentially struggling with it and seeking the advice of a therapist. And the therapist is trying to, like, describe it, discern it, figure it out, map it, um understand it that sort of thing uh she gets a lot wrong of course and she does a lot of unethical things um for the sake of drama i guess so you know <laughs> if you have a therapist like her run 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 far far away far far away um so it's actually not a very good movie with respect to to dissociative identity disorder is not a very good movie. <laughs> I mean, it's a it's a it's a decent film. It's a decent M Night Shyamalan film, I guess. Um, he got ruined, I think, in Glass a little bit. Um, the character that uh, that James McAvoy plays, I think he got ruined a little bit. I think Split should have existed on its own. But, you know, everyone's got to build a universe, don't they? So now we have the, uh, now we have the Shyamalan-averse. shyamalan universe Okay. Oh, so let me tell, tell you about dissociative identity disorders. So dissociative disorders in, in general. Great. Where was I? Dissociative identity disorder. Off the rails here. Um... <coughs> in the TSM in the DSM 4 text revision it was renamed from multiple personality disorder okay um and so the biggest symptom that you would see from this disorder is two or more distinct and alternating personalities so distinct and alternating are two very important things to have for this disorder. Now, how many of you have seen Identity? Which I think is a better representation of multiple personality disorder than Split. Or dissociative identity disorder, excuse me. Whew. I'm tired. Kids are, uh, kids are a handful. So have you seen uh, Identity? Because I'm going to play this clip. It's probably going to get pinged for uh, copyright. But, um, yeah. It's a fun one. I think um, people would enjoy it. That's for sure. It's a good. Um, it's a good sl slasher film. I'm going to show you part of it. Try not to ruin the ending because it's a really good ending. So I'm going to go ahead and play that before. So that should be renamed. Somebody should come redo this. Where did you learn that thing? Who am I speaking to? Look at me. Who am I speaking to right now? Doc. Edwin? What's happening? Please be quiet. Maybe you can hear what we're saying. Of course I can hear what you're fucking saying. Oh, um, language. You missed your last appointment. Where have you been? Again. Try and think back. Where have you been? 
All right, I was uh, driving this actress and we got stuck at the motel. There was a storm. And we couldn't get out, we couldn't get out because of the storm. What happened at the motel? People started dying. I mean, their bodies didn't make any sense. They, they disappeared. Edward, I'd like to show something to you. Do you recognize this man? No. Well, that man, Edward, is Malcolm Rivers. He's had a very troubled life. He was arrested four years ago and convicted of the murder of six people in a violent rampage. Look at this. Detective, please. Edward, listen to me. When faced with an intense trauma, a child's mind may fracture, creating disassociated identities. That's exactly what happened to Malcolm Rivers. He developed a condition that is commonly known as multiple personality syndrome. you, Edward, are one of his personalities. Cue the thunder. What? what? Watch this. Oh, yeah. Jesus Christ, man. What did you do? Try and calm to my face. Try and keep calm. Where the fuck is my face? Edward, that is your face. Why am I tied keep up? Calm. What? Edward, please. Jesus Christ. Where is my face? Edward, stay calm. No, I'm not gonna stay calm. Why am I tied up like this? Who are all these people? What happened at the motel? Where is everybody? They don't exist, Edward. You were all created by Malcolm as a child. You're a liar! So I'm gonna stop that one there. Because um, I don't want to ruin the ending for everyone, just in case you um, you uh, you want to go watch it. It's it's really good. It's like it's really good um, as as a film as a film goes. Um, probably gonna talk about it in an upcoming um, upcoming podcast episode. So yeah. Um, what uh, what else did I want to say about it? Oh, uh, not the film. So did. Okay. What the first I think one of the first cases that really brought it to the forefront of everyone's mind was Sybil. Um the movie Sybil. Um and that's where diagnoses of it skyrocketed. Okay. After that. It's rarely found outside of North America. Okay. Um it may reflect a role playing by people who are vulnerable to therapist suggestions. So we don't really know. These are critics comments, by the way. Um, some other critics also view the disorder as a manifestation of feelings of anxiety um, or as a response to learned behaviors. Um, if they are reinforced as anxiety reduction techniques, right? So turn into a different person to reduce anxiety and so then these are reinforced coping strategies for that particular thing so there are proponents and critics uh on this because and and they they are constantly at it because it's uh it's important okay it's controversial okay all right so let's finish up by talking about therapy therapy so psych so i'm specifically talking about therapy but there are other ways um uh there are other ways to get therapy so there's behavior uh biomedical therapy or drug therapy um but i think so personally speaking i think the best combination is an eclectic approach which is basically taking those top two the psychotherapy and the biomedical therapy and combining them into a, a comprehensive treatment plan um because there is a lot of evidence that suggests that psychological disorders do have um do have basis in 
biochemical uh, imbalances, whether it's too high, too much, too little, whatever. So if you can combine that with behavioral or cognitive restructuring, then I think you've got a great approach, okay? I think you've got a great approach. So I am, if I were to compare these three, these three, I would say eclectic approach is my preferred strategy. Lots of people go see counselors and therapists in the first one, psychotherapy, and they, generally speaking, do not have the ability to combine biomedical techniques because they're not medical doctors. So medical doctors and nurses can do that one, but not everyone can do um, an eclectic approach. So just be mindful of that if you are seeking therapy. So Taswood, for example, Taswood uh, Center for Wellness, which is what we have a Eureka has a contract with for um, therapy needs. That's all psychotherapy. Okay, you can get a referral to a medical doctor, but at point of contact, it's only that first approach. Okay. So what I want to uh, mention to you all is um, is to focus on this the data surrounding whether or not therapy is effective. And I will say that I am a bit biased when it comes to this. Um, I'm not skeptical or, or um, um, cynical about therapy. Some people are skeptical or cynical about therapy, and that's okay for them. But what I want to impart to you all is that it is okay they are effective and um it's good to be vulnerable sometimes i will come back to that in just a second okay so as far as effectiveness is concerned thanks rollins i appreciate that um is that um people who go to therapy are likely to see uh or are likely to perceive that it's um uh uh, improving for them. It's an improvement for them. Okay. Um, 90%. These are testimonials, so they are not scientific. But ask anybody who's gone to therapy uh, for any extended period of time, and um, they, will, they will likely say they felt better after doing it. A lot of people just need to talk things out sometimes, which is why psychotherapy is sometimes referred to as talk therapy. Because sometimes just talking about stuff, especially if you do not have an inner or outer monologue, that is, you don't talk to yourself inside your head or you don't talk to yourself outside of your head. If, for those folks who don't have inner monologues, being able to talk, putting things out into the universe as, um, as literal uh, um, verbalizations then, you know, sometimes people just need to do that, right? Ashton, I'm sorry to hear that. Um, I'm sorry to hear that it's not gone well. I'll, I'll try to offer some tips for the future um, at, here at the end. Clinicians, on the other hand, um, clinicians, on the other hand, note the uh, skepticism with particip with participants in therapy so patients or clients okay they see that people often enter therapy in crisis so that's obviously a biasing event or set of events or traumas for therapy right um they come in with the belief that the therapy will be beneficial and effective okay and beliefs and expectations play a role in feeling better, okay? Clients will generally speak kindly of their therapists, and clients want to believe the therapy was worth the effort, and added to effort, cost, right? Because in our society, the effort is also connected to cost, okay? So, therapists, like the rest of us, are mindful of these criticisms 
but also have their own biases as well, such as confirmation bias, that they'll be the one to crack the case. Okay. Um, they want patients to not come in emphasizing the problems, but focusing on their well-being, depending on what therapists, the therapist studies and, and practices. Um, but really when it comes down to it is, let's not listen to clients or clinicians. Let's listen to what the outcome research shows. And this is actually more helpful than listening to patients talk about their own experiences or clinicians talking about their own experiences. Not to minimize the people who've shared in chat. Um, definitely share. I will be sharing my experience here in just a minute. Um, but the outcome research, I think the outcome research uh, through randomized cl clinical trials as well as meta-analyses, so that is taking, that is basically averaging statistical findings into summary statistics, okay? So the research shows that people who go under, undergo psychotherapy are more likely to prove and improve more quickly. So that's like, that's a, that's a significant quantity, okay? Um, and as I have on the slide here, two thirds of people who receive treatment for disorders that do not involve any psychotic, um, psychosis symptoms like hallucinations or delusions improved markedly, right? So this was like a vast improvement, um, from f the feeling that they had before getting the therapy and after getting the therapy. Um, those who undergo any kind of psychotherapy also have less chance to relapse than um, people who do not. And comparatively to medical treatment, psychotherapy is more cost-effective, okay? So, I mean, it is cheaper. <laughs> um, however, the last point does need to be made. Research does show that people who don't receive psychotherapeutic treatment also often improve. Okay. So, you know, I will say that this graph really highlights the, um, really highlights the, the, the difference between receiving treatment and not receiving treatment. So imagine these two curves, okay? These curves reflect all the people that either are, are not, or have a disorder and are not receiving treatment. So that is this blue curve. And then hiding behind it with, with the, um, orange curve here is clients who receive psychotherapy. And they cut off the back part of the um, curve because you don't actually need it for this. Okay. So, um, and the the tops of these, just like the bell curve we talked about with, with respect to IQ, intelligence, right? The top parts here represent the average person in each of those curves. And on the x-axis here, we have poor outcomes versus good outcomes. Okay, so this is a continuum of outcomes after receiving treatment, okay? And so what you can see is that the average psychotherapy client, the average psychotherapy client, so, so um, the other half of the people have better outcomes than the average psychotherapy client, right? So if we were to, to talk about this, then these people have under the orange curve, not the blue curve, look at just under the orange curve, have a really great outcome, okay? But if we draw a dotted line down to here, it crosses the blue curve at this point. This reflects 80% of untreated people have poorer outcomes than the average person that goes to treatment. This is a meta-analysis from 475 studies. 475 studies this curve was created. These curves were created from, okay? The 80% better. The average psychotherapy client is 80% better than 
uh, or is better is better off than 80% of uh, people who don't seek treatment. I think 475 pieces of information here summarized here is um, is it effective? I think yeah. I think we're gonna go with yeah. Okay. Um, some some therapies, different kinds of psychotherapies work for different kinds of disorders. So behavioral therapies are good for behavioral problems like bedwetting phobias. Um, marital problems, sexual dysfunctions, psychodynamic therapy, which we don't really talk about it. We don't talk about the the kinds of, of um, therapies uh, in this class. But if you took abnormal with Dr. Kaiser, you'd probably um, talk about these. Depression, anxiety work um, with psychodynamic therapy. CBT, cognitive cognitive behavioral therapy, work with anxiety, depression, and PTSD. This is a combination. We're going to rejigger your thoughts and um uh rejigger your uh your um behaviors okay but i think overarching regardless of these kinds of therapies and the things that they treat if the problems are clear cut then you're going to have the best chance of success okay the best chance of success and even if it isn't super clear cut, what you want to invest in is researching somebody who uses an evidence based practice. Um, an evidence based practice, right? So they use current research to inform their therapy, to inform the kinds of things they tell their clients, okay? The kinds of things they have their clients think about, the kinds of things they have their clients do. Evidence based practices. One of the most important things to look for in a therapist. Now, to end, I'm just going to um, end with a PSA about finding a therapist slash my experience with therapy. So, um, as I mentioned in a previous stream uh, slash class, I, I, I suffer from generalized anxiety disorder. Um, and it's a bit of a struggle, of course. Uh, and, uh, when Ollie was born, so this is six years ago now, um, it was a lot. It was a lot to deal with. Being in grad school, having a new baby, and all of the, you know, finances and all that stuff, living in Santa Barbara is not cheap. So, I decided to seek some therapy, and I found a really great, um, a really great cognitive behavioral, th um, scientist who really changed the way that I viewed the things that I was doing, um, she gave me a, of what she called tools for the toolbox. Um, I had really great insurance at the time too. So I only, it only cost me $15 every time I saw her. So I saw her twice a week because it was like $30 a month. That's doable. Um, so, um, and she was, a, she was a true client centered therapist. I would, um, I would walk in and we could be silent for the entire 50 minute session if I didn't say anything. She wanted, uh, and this is what like true client centered therapy is, is that you don't start talking, the therapist doesn't start talking until the client starts talking. So there were, there were sessions where I like, we said, hello, hello, how are you? How are you? That sort of thing. And then we'd just sit there for one or two minutes before I, I gathered my thoughts and um, um, started that session. Okay. okay. Um, and, and so I went to her for two years before we left Santa Barbara. And, and ever since then, I've been really sad about it. <laughs> but really, I've been really sad about it. I'm like, I don't know if I'm ever going to find a, um, a person like her. Um, and it is entirely possible that I won't. Um, it is entirely possible that you... Um, have had a therapist or a counselor or some sort of um, communicator that hasn't been great. That hasn't been great. Um, and I, I'm definitely, uh, I'm definitely sad about that for you because one of the most important things is the comfort level that you feel with that person. The comfort level that you feel with that person because you're you got to be vulnerable with this person you can't have any walls or shields up you got to be 100 vulnerable they have tissues standing by you have to be open 
to um, criticism, to um, your fears, your anxieties, your struggles, your troubles, um, your relationships, everything. You got to be open to it, and that's what the most important piece is: is to to is to feel connected with that person um, in an, in a in a structured but intimate sort of way. Okay. Um, other things that I think are useful for finding a therapist are their treatment approach. You're more than welcome to ask them. You're more than welcome to say what kind of stuff do you do in your tr in in your um, treatment process, uh, because this will let you know whether or not you agree or disagree with their um, approaches. Say you're not religious, and um, this particular therapist uh, sort of takes a twelve step approach, and um, brings in spirituality. If you are not comfortable with that, then obviously that you're not going to develop that bond that I have here in this last paragraph. All right. Um, their values, what they value, what they want their clients to leave with, because obviously the goal is for most people to stop therapy once they feel better. Right. Just like any doctor or healthcare provider says, I, I mean, I, I wish I don't need, I wish I didn't need to see you for the struggles that you're having. Okay what their credentials are. It's very important to, to find out what their credentials are. So you have clinical psychologists, they have PhDs or PsyDs, PSYD, okay? You could see a psychiatrist. Many of them have MDs, but you could also see a DO, okay? These folks can prescribe medication. People with PhDs and PsyDs cannot prescribe medication. They are not allowed to, it's illegal in the United States. And generally speaking, elsewhere in the world too. Um, clinical or psychiatric social workers, they, they would have an MSW, MSW or an LCSW. LCSW stands for licensed clinical social worker. Like LCSWs are licensed by the state that they work in. Okay. You can also uh, see counselors who've received significant clinical training. Um, these people have MFTs, marriage and family therapists credentials, or they have an, a master's of uh, arts or a master's of science, an MS or an MA in clinical psychology. Okay, so there are many credentials to explore and you're, the level of expertise is what you're kind of looking for. My therapist in Santa Barbara had a PhD in cognitive psychology, or uh, cognitive behavioral, I mean clinical psychology with an emphasis on cognitive behavioral therapy. I don't know, that is a lot. Um, and then how much is it going to cost? Unfortunately, that's a thing to discuss with the potential potential provider um, here in the United States is how much is it going how much is it going to cost? And most insurances still treat mental um, disorders and, and um, psychological disorders with um, complete and utter disdain versus going to the doctor for some physical problem or going to the hospital. Okay. So how much is it going to cost? These things are really important, um, really important things to note. So that's all I have for this class. Um, for those of you who, who stuck around to the very end, hey, it was fun. Um, I appreciate you being in my, my Psych 101 class. And, uh, you know, if I don't have you in another class, 